um yeah so for completeness of the video um hello everyone my name is tajuddin and i'm the call host for today debs from the ols team who is the developer for ols will be leading um today's presentation which is an introduction to github uh before we start as usual i will remind you that this uh the code of conduct for ols apply to this call as well and if you do experience any unacceptable behavior, kindly send in an email to teams at weareols.org. Uh, or if you want to report to an individual organizer, kindly do that by reporting to uh, you, Malvika Baranis, or myself. Um, also, remember that we are going to have breakout rooms. So if you prefer to be in a writing breakout room, kindly edit your name to reflect uh, W at the beginning. If you want to be in an English speaking, kindly add um, S dash E N as I've seen others do it already. If you prefer to, uh, you can also write it in the chat and I can help you edit uh, the name so that it will reflect on uh, your name for the breakout room creation. With that, I will hand over to Debs who will take us through the session. Thank you. Thanks, Taj. I got so distracted trying to welcome everybody, but couldn't keep up. So if I didn't officially mention your name in the chat, welcome. Really lovely to meet you all. So like Taj mentioned, we're going to be doing an intro to GitHub today. And some of you might already be familiar with GitHub, which is great, meaning I have co-teachers cool today. And if this is your first time hearing about Git or GitHub, not to worry, you have a team of helpful experts here to help you. I'm just going to quickly share the slides. I'm going to share my screen as well. So if you'd rather look at my screen, that's fine, but you can find the slides right here. And I'm going to start screen share. Right about um, now. The, the slide said I need access to access the slides. I clicked on the link and it's requesting that I, I request for access. Right. That's a shared drive that uh that's oh, me. um a moment, uh, please. I will I will I will work on that. Thank you, Tash. Um, if you open very... it from the from a part, it opens, I think. I think it's the same one. I don't know. It's the same. So the one in the from a part has been published online, and then the one in the the one the link is from the uh organizational uh, uh Google Drive. Hey, so I'm starting screen share for real now. I know I said it already, but I'm sharing now. Um, could you please confirm that you can see my screen and the part of my screen that I actually want you to see? Okay, great. Um, my name is Debs, D-E-B-S, the easier version of my name, and I'll be walking you through GitHub today. These are some useful references. I mean, it's it's usually typical that you would find references at the end of the material, but for full disclosure, we've put it at the beginning just to give credit to the plenty brilliant minds that have helped us put together this material. So let's get right into it. Now, when we speak of GitHub, we're mostly talking about collaboration and how you can work with other people on the same project from Canada or from Brazil or Nigeria, wherever you might be. And when you work with a collaborative document, there are certain challenges that you experience working with this document. And I would like to see some responses in the chat. If you've ever had to collaborate with other individuals on a project, if you could just quickly share what that experience was like for you, what challenges you encountered while trying to work with others. 
I'm keeping an eye on the chat to see. Okay. Chaos. <laughs> that sounds really familiar. So someone said in the chat that it was chaotic trying to collaborate with others using version control, a term which we will define soon. Different time zones, right? Different preferences of platforms. I might want to use GitHub. Someone else would want to use GitLab. Someone wants to stick with Google Docs. So that's right. Different working culture. True. True, we all have different styles of collaboration. You have to resave the document multiple times with a different name. Finding compromise can be difficult. These are all such useful thoughts about it. And just to confirm that my screen is still being shown and it's font size is good enough for everyone. So like it's written here, working asynchronously, that is basically working at different times, not simultaneously. It can be a bit difficult. I mean, if I had to work with someone who lived in Canada, for instance, I might want to work at 5 p.m. and it's 10 for them. It's way too early for them to want to do any real work. So having different time zones, being in different locations, and so many versions of the same document. For example, if we were putting together a recipe for cake, maybe carrot cake. I have a friend who has a serious problem with carrot cake. He doesn't get why we need carrot cake. But say, for instance, we're putting together the recipe for carrot cake, and you had just put on the recipe two tablespoons of baking soda. I have never made carrot cake, so that might be utterly wrong. Don't take my word for it. And someone else puts in five cups of flour. You're just seeing new additions to this recipe and you're not sure who is writing what. Why have they written this? You don't understand their thought process. And every time they write, they save the file and have to have so many different names of the file, you get lost at some point. And this is why we have Git. So this is a nice illustration of a fox. She has a folder, which we call in Git terms, a repository or a repo. So that's basically the same thing. Folder, directory, repository, same thing. So a folder just like you have on your computer would have files of different formats, pictures of your cats would have music. And this Fox constantly edits the files within the folder. And when each edit is made, a new file can be created but that's not a very efficient way to track things. Say, for example, you're doing a PhD. I'm not doing a PhD. I wish I were. But if you were doing a PhD and you wanted to turn a draft, you have your draft saved as draft one. And you make some new edits after the correction has been made. And you call that new format final submission. And for whatever reason, your supervisor is saying, this is not good enough. I need more effort. So you say final submission two, really the final submission, final, final, final submission three, and you have so many different files. But this is chaotic, as we've already heard. There are better ways to do it. So the terms you might hear using Git would be revisions and versions. So every time you make a change, Every time you make a change, you get a new version of the file. 
and version control. This is a very lovely illustration, one that I personally like. So you have so many files that you can't even find the original drafts to look for the article that you cited that's no longer in your final, final, final submission. And it's so confusing, but someone right here has a brilliant idea. Let's do version control. We don't need work copy.js, work copy filter.js. We don't need so many versions. Let's try and store a history of the file progressively as we change it so that we can always come back to the file at a particular point. All of these are just to buttress the same points of adding, taking away from a file, highlighting something new, removing, adding further, so many changes. So version control basically helps you to manage all your changes called revision to revise. So version control helps you keep track of every single change made to a file. And it uses very simple tools. So tools like Google Drive, which we might already know, um, Dropbox, this, they all have built-in version control but not everyone would want to use that pattern of version control. Personally, I don't use Google Drive for version control. That might be obvious since I'm teaching GitHub. Well, so it says here that we have more advanced tools like Git, which is a local version control system. And at this point, you might already be wondering, I've heard Git and I've heard GitHub, what's the difference? As we progress, it will become clearer and Git is actually out of the scope of this particular um, session because Git is monstrous. Git is the software that does the actual tracking while GitHub is the web version where you can easily see the files that you're changing. I might be getting ahead of myself here. So if I say something that's not really clear, you can give me an X on Zoom. You can give me a reaction. So I know you're not following. Or if you're feeling extra enthusiastic, you could give me a green to say, keep going, I understand. Okay. All right, so I think at this point, we would move to something a bit more practical. But I have to mention really quickly that every time you make a change, it's like when you're at a wedding, for instance, and the photographer wants to take a picture of the wedding guests. This is how I like to picture Git or GitHub. They say, one, two, three, guests wearing green come to the platform we want to take a picture of you so every time you take a snapshot of the file that's you making a commit going to quickly close this tab and i see greens i like greens thank you I may have accidentally lost my slides. Oh, there we are. All right. So we can collaborate on GitHub. Say we have a dinosaur who owns a project, but has a doc and a fox also working on that document. It's easier for them to work together if they use a proper version control system like Git and GitHub. GitHub, what? So much talk about GitHub. Let's see the practical aspects of GitHub so it makes more sense. So this is the interface. This is what you see when you go to github.com. 
it's their landing page and I think it's really properly designed. That's not the point of the lesson. So GitHub is a place where you can host your repositories. Can I quickly ask what a repository can be called other than a repository? Answers in the chat, please. Let's see. Right. Projects. Yes. True. Sure. Folder. Yes. That's true. So folder, project, repo, all the same as a repository. So GitHub lets you host your projects, your repos online where everyone has access to it. So since it's on this web page, you can have a bunch of collaborators. It's limitless. You can work with two people, three people, a thousand people on one project. You'll be amazed how much good stuff has happened on GitHub. So GitHub also provides you a web interface. So that browser you saw earlier, this one, it provides you an interface for your version control. It's easier when you can see it, especially if you're a visual person like me. It's also good for project management. So you know where you are at every point, who is assigned to what task, and it's easier to communicate what you're doing at every point on GitHub. It's also useful for any project where a group of people are working together, collaboration. Pop quiz, do you have a GitHub account? Green check marks if you have a GitHub account and X if you don't. Let's see, let me see two GitHub users. Three, four, five. Okay. Okay. So for the sake of those who might not already have a GitHub account, I'm going to ask that you go to github.com and create an account. If you're having difficulty signing up, Please let us know in the chat and we can help you. And finally, something exciting. We have our very first GitHub exercise. What would it be, I wonder? So we're going to create our first repository, repo, folder, project. We're going to create the very first one on GitHub. So if you could all go to github.com, that would be lovely. Remember, a repository is the projects that would contain all the files that make up the larger project. So our first task would be to create a new GitHub repo. I'm going to exit from this tab and going to share my share the slide that has my own GitHub account. Green marks if you've made it to your GitHub successfully. So why would you need to create a new GitHub repo for a new project? Answers in the chat. Taj is excited. He likes exams.
Okay, so we're going to create our first GitHub repository. I'm going to start sharing my screen again. Okay. Hopefully you can see my screen with my GitHub repository with my GitHub account. Okay, I see nodes. Now to create a new GitHub repository, if you found your way successfully to the landing page of your own GitHub account, you would need to tap on this icon right here, create new. That's one way to do it. And then create new repository. This is one way to do it. So if you click on, it takes you here. But I'm going to go back just to show you an alternative way of doing this. If you click on this tab that says repositories right here, then you have a shiny green button here. It says new. There's also this option, new repository or new. And what shall we call our new repository? Let's stick with the material and call it friendly collab party. Party. So the name friendly collab party is available and we can go ahead and create a repo or a project called friendly collab party. This would be where you would add in a description of the repository. So what is this for? Is this a portfolio website? Is this a new medical device, medical software you're building? Is this just cake recipe? So a description would go here. Useful description of project. And this is another super important part. There's the option of public meaning anyone on the internet can see this repository and private, meaning you get to pick who sees your repo. So public or private. I believe that we're either big fans of open science or trying to be big fans of open science. So public would be more suited for this. And you can add something called a readme file you will see what a readme is, but it gives you the opportunity to provide a longer description of your project. I see a hand up. Yes. Yeah, thank you so much for the detailed um, description so far. I have a comment about the public and private. So okay. even though I understand where being trained to be open science researchers. I'm wondering whether in real life, we should actually make all our repositories public. So for example, I create a project, I'm working with a group of researchers from different countries. Should I actually make my repository public that everyone on the internet can see the project that we're working on? Is that really what the practice is? Or is that something I can make private and share with my collaborators? And then there might be some aspects of the project that I want to share publicly. So for example, our code or some other things. That's, that's a really, really good question. And probably a couple of other people were thinking about it. It's not a rule of thumb to make all your repos public. That's why in, I think, week one of Open Seeds, you're taught openness by design. There are some aspects of your work that will rather not have public. For example, if you were a conservationist working to protect animals about to go extinct, we don't want to see the locations of those animals so that we don't put them at risk of being poached. If you were working with medical data, for instance, in building, say, an electronic health record system, 
we wouldn't want to see people's personal data online. But the idea behind it is to make knowledge as reasonably open as possible so that people can benefit from your work and potentially reuse your work. So ultimately it's left to you and the unique thing that you're working on. So there's no one who would tell you make all your repos public. I hope that helped a bit. Did it, Ijoma? Yes, thank you. Thank you, and thank you for asking. I'm tempted to make it private. No. Open Science Advocates. We're going to make our repo public and add a readme. Remember, a readme, once you check this box, would help you give a longer description, quite unlike this one I've put here. A git ignore is also out of the scope of this particular discussion. If you had some files in your projects that you wanted to ignore or you wanted to make private, you didn't want them to be on GitHub, those files will be listed in your git ignore. So say you want some aspects of your work to be made public, you can use this tab public, this option, and then put the files that you want private in your git ignore. That's also an easy way to meet things in the middle. Licenses, very important concept in open access publication or open software or open basically. So it tells people what exactly they can do with your work. So if you say, for example, you put a Creative Commons license on your work, you're saying that you give people the access to it. They don't need to pay for it. Depending on what other tag you add to the Creative Commons, they can reuse your work. So this is also something very important. But I'm sure when Taj will organize a call, especially for license, that would be a better place to talk about it. And so we go ahead and create our new repository. And just like that, if you've been following along with the steps, you probably already created your own repository and hopefully for someone it's their first time so we all feel accomplished. So back to the lesson. Um, I think Laura has a hand up. Oh, thank you. Yes, I wanted to ask you again about getting ignore. I missed that part, I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. Okay. So a git ignore file basically is where you can list out all the files within your folder, your project or your repo, the files that you don't want to be on GitHub. You want them on your local computer, but you don't want them showing on GitHub. You can list them in your git ignore. Okay, that makes sense, thank you. Are there any other questions? None for now. But um, if you think of- I, I have one. my hand up, sorry. Yeah. yeah, just a quick question. I've made my repository public, I created it. What if I want to edit something about it? I was trying to figure it out, but I could not. Is that something you can please quickly show? Like you create a repository and you want to edit maybe the settings that you use to create it. Okay, that's a good question. And that's part of why we're here, to learn how to make changes on your repository. So we're still going to talk about that. Okay. Yeah. All right. It's good to see that someone is enthusiastic about it. Okay. Quick check that you can still see my screen. Right, so there are some components, some important things to note about the interface in your first GitHub repository. For instance, at the top left corner, you can see your username. 
So if my username were to be Taj at zero one, right here, you would have Taj at zero one forward slash friendly collaboration party. And you also have the repo name right there, friendly collab party. You have code. Here, hopefully you see me hovering over these elements, code. And when we start talking about the idea of branching, it would make sense why we have main here. Remember the, the main, pun unintended, the main idea behind GitHub is that you can work with many people and they would do their own version of the work on something called a branch, which we would talk about if time permits. So the next component we'll talk about is branch. So for now we have just one branch of the project, just one branch. We also have the readme file, which is the file that we have right here with the title of the repository, the name, and the brief description that we added earlier. So you can always edit your readme file to add more details about what your project contains and how someone would use your work or contribute to it. And there's a green, really bright green code button here. It lets you download a copy of your repository. You can download this for your local computer and you don't need internet to access it after you've downloaded it. And we still have the same plus symbol right here if you wanted to create a new repository. So that's what the plus symbol is for. Something else we have is the fork here. We'll still talk about the fork soon enough, but for now, this is where you would create a fork of someone's repository. And right here is how you would add a file. So if you clicked on this, you could create a new file. You can also upload the file directly from your computer. There's also the number of commits, also a term that we haven't explained in detail yet. So a commit would be each new change that you made to your project. That's what a commit is ideally. And so far we've done just one thing, which is to create this repo and the readme. So we have one commit, one action performed and we have the pencil symbol right here, which if you click on it, would let you edit the readme file. I've done a lot of things within two minutes, so I'm going to ask, does anyone have a question? Question, contribution, confusion. I see green, so we're good to go. Right. Oh, that's exciting. We created our first repo. Some of you, it's not your first, but still equally exciting. Now we will learn briefly about Markdown, which is a kind of language that we use to write on GitHub or write in the files within our project. So what you have opened now is the readme in our friendly collab party repo or folder. Markdown has a specific syntax, meaning it has a laid down set of rules for how you write particular elements or, and we're going to see some of that now. 
so to create a really large heading, I'm just going to go to line four. Zoom in a bit so everyone can see. So we're going to write our first header. See, um, header one. and preview. So header one has been written with the hash. You have to begin with hash. Otherwise it doesn't register as a header. For instance, this line doesn't have a hash in front. So it's just a normal paragraph. But the other ones that have the hash in front, they are headers. And we have different levels of headers. For instance, header two. It helps if you write along. It helps you remember. So for comparison, you can see how the three headers, we have the first one really large and the second one just a bit smaller and the third quite visibly smaller than the first. So that's the idea behind headers. Like you see here, header one, header two, header three, header four. And we're going to try bullet points now. So bullet points. You can already guess that this just comes out as a paragraph. So bullet points right here is small. So to create a bullet point, you just use the hyphen symbol and say list item one. Or we could make it more fun and say some of my that's not how you spell my some of my favorite things so what are some of your favorite things that we could use to make this list <laughs> Sorry, what? What are some of your favorite things that we could use to practice bullet points in Markdown? Who put cats in the chats? So good. And apparently someone really likes cats, so cats. Rain. Friends in the UK won't appreciate that I just put that. That's okay. And next. Sorry. And to make something bold or italicized and don't worry about cramming any of the syntax these things are always accessible online and if you literally if you forget any of them you could just google how do i make a text bold in markdown and it will be out in two seconds and we also have a document that contains this already so don't worry too much bold text and you would wrap it with asterisks to make it bold. If you were to put just one asterisk like this, you would make an italicized text. Let's see them. Header one, header two, header three plain old paragraph saying some of my favorite things and we list out food, cats, rain. And we were able to make this text bold. 
sure you can see that it's bold and we were able to make this in italics because we use the asterisks. Now we're quickly going to do another exercise. Your task would be to create a readme file for your repo and say stuff about your project, list tasks of different expertise clearly, add names and ID of collaborators, invite others with specific skills. So you say, I'm looking to build this website and I need someone who is familiar with JavaScript. But that's not an exercise for today. You get to try it on your own. This is what we will try instead. But before that exercise, I'm going to explain some of the terms that I mentioned in passing earlier, but didn't explain fully. So the first one is a commit. Remember one of the problems of collaboration is that when someone does something or changes something in the file, you don't know exactly who did it. But what if there was a way to take a snapshot of everything you change, attach a descriptive message to what you've changed to that particular version and have it stored forever? That's basically what a commit is. You add a line and you save it. So we always know who has committed something right or wrong in the repo or in the project. Green checks, if that made sense. Okay. The next term we will talk about is the branch and a fork. So basically, when you have a folder, Think about a local folder in your computer. Don't think about GitHub. Just think about a folder containing some pictures, songs on your computer. And someone wanted to contribute to that folder, but they didn't want to mess up the current state of your own folder. Ideally, they would make a copy of that folder and add things to that copy right? So it's similar to what happens on GitHub. You make a copy of the person's project, which we call a fork, F-O-R-K. And to that fork, your copy of their project, you can make all the changes you want and then ask them nicely whether they would want to have these changes that exist in your copy in the main project. So that's the idea behind a fork. But for a branch, a branch is basically one unique path of your project. So you have the central one, which we usually call main, and then you could have one branch on which you're working on a specific thing. So we have a huge website and one person wants to work on the homepage of the website and add more content to the homepage. So that person creates a branch called homepage. Someone else wants to work on documentation and they create a branch called documentation. Homepage and documentation never mix until we want them to. And when you want the work on a branch to be part of the main repository, you create something called a pull request, which is you asking, please take a look at what I've done on my copy on this branch to see whether it's good enough to be added to the main project. So a pull request is you asking nicely whether you can add your contributions to the main project. 
And a merge would be the person saying, yes, you can add your work to the main project. So requests and merge. These stems will make more sense in exactly one minute because you're going to be creating a fork, making some changes on a unique branch and then creating a pull request to say, add my changes to the main one. And I'm going to either merge, um, say, go. Oh. Hand, hand okay, Ijeoma. Okay. Please fire Sorry. A quick question. I understand that for a branch, you can work in a branch and make a pull request and then the merge can happen or not. Does that also apply to a fork? So if, if I have a fork, I've made a copy of the main project, made some changes. Now how, because I know you also say you cannot ask like, the owner or maybe the PI of the project to see if those okay. changes have been incorporated. So would that also mean making a, a pull request similar to when you do the same for a branch? Yes. So I see a slight disconnect in your understanding. So when you make a fork, which is your copy of the person's project on your fork, you create different branches for all the different things that you want to add to the main project. So when you make a copy saying, I have this project and I want to occasionally or regularly contribute to the project. If today I find a typo on the project, I create a branch for that particular contribution I want to make. And I say this branch is called typo fix. So on typo fix in your fork, you fix the typo and create a pull request from that particular branch in your fork, in your copy of the main project. So branches are found within your copy of the main project. Okay. Does so that make sense? Branches are found in, your, in the fork, which is the copy of the main project that you have made. And that's where you can make your suggestions for changes. Now, for the main project, can the main project also have branches? And does that mean that any change you make to the branch of the main project does not require a pull request because you're making it directly on the main project and not on a copy? Okay. That's, that's a really good observation, knowing that the main project has branches and your fork can also have branches. Now to create a branch on someone's main project would be wrong. And for one, people don't just leave right access open to anyone to just make a branch on their project directly. Right access is basically saying, does this person have permission to do changes on this project or do they necessarily have to make a copy first? So okay. the main project has the capacity for branching. You can do branches on the main project or it's not good practice to make branches on the main project unless you're the owner of the project, then you can make branches there. But if other people were to collaborate with me, I don't expect them to be making branches directly on my project. I expect them to make branches on their copy of the project. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. So what it means is that if I, if I create my repository, I have to limit access to like certain privileges so that people can only make changes on fork copy yes. of the project and not on my main project. Okay. Exactly. So right. by default, it's already established that when you create a project or a repository, not just anyone can have access to it by default. That's how it is. Unless you give someone specifically access to the project, they can't create a branch. You don't have to do any additional thing to prevent them from being able to create that branch. If you attempt to create a branch on someone's project, it takes you to create 
a fork. You can't just create branches on people's trees, right? That's not very nice. Okay, so exercise time. Taj, how are we doing time-wise? I think we are slow, but I think the most important thing is really like the, what we are able to get to, do it very well. So we're supposed to have this exercise after you went through it uh, in breakout rooms, but... I will ask, do we want to continue the way we have been doing where we um, have people try it out and then ask questions or do we want to go to breakout rooms? Up and one, yes, no breakout rooms. So we continue with no break outcomes. Okay. Right, no breakout rooms. I feel super excited to have someone create their own pull request today. So this is what we mentioned earlier. Saving each version of changes that you make to a file you have the option of putting a nice message. It's called a commit message to say exactly what you've done in that change. And it's good practice to have a descriptive commit message. So don't just say update readme.md. Update is quite vague. That's not very clear. What did you do? Added section on contribution guideline to read me that sounds better so anyone who sees the commit knows exactly what you did and this is the idea of a branch and fork again creating branches so you can do different things on each branch for example branch c2 here is specifically for a bug fix well C3 is the main branch. And this is what I mentioned earlier, write access. You can't make branches on a repo when you don't have write access. So you make a fork where you can create your own branches. So a fork is your copy, your independent copy of the repo. You don't need a right access on your fork, it's yours. GitHub exercise time. You're going to go to this link. But this should say, Tash, do we have this ready for OLS 9 or would they practice with, okay, okay. Thank you. I'm going to share a link to uh, OLS 9 in a moment. Um... So what you would aim to accomplish here is to go to the repo OLS 9, create a fork, which is your copy of OLS 9, because we don't make branches on people's projects. We make a copy of the projects and then we make branches on our copy of the project. Um, Debs, will you walk through the example? Like, sure. open your GitHub and... Sure. Checking that you can see me in the OLS 9 repo. Okay. I'm going to zoom out a bit. So this is the repo. I could attempt to come here and make a new branch on someone else's project, but because that's not nice, 
I won't do that. Instead, I'm going to create a fork. So click on fork. Choose a name. I'm still going to leave it as OLS9. And the description is OLS9 cohort resources and create fork. So I already have a fork of OLS9. If I didn't have a fork of OLS9, I would be allowed to just create it right here. But I have a fork already. But for you, it should work seamlessly because you didn't have a copy of the repo before now. I'm hoping that's working out nicely for everyone. Let's see reactions in the chat. Hey, I see Tom's Ops. Tom's Ops. Tom Ops. Yeah, I see a hat. This is going well. If there's anyone struggling with this particular task, please let us know in the chat. Taj is very helpful. So the next part of the task is to create a branch. You can call your branch anything. So in your fork, you would have an option of creating a new branch, create a branch. And we would want you to edit the readme on that branch right here at the bottom is the readme so this is the file you're going to attempt to edit remember the little pencil symbol here means that you can edit that pencil you can edit and add any line any line you could add a line at the bottom that says this is my first pull request i'm sorry can i ask you a question i think i'm kind of so okay. there i thought i created a fork but now under mine i'm seeing that there are 12 forks and one branch. Am I in the right place? And I tried, I created it and put it in my name. And I can see that what I'm looking at is, uh, has my name. But then I'm seeing that there are already 12 folks on it and one branch. And so under it, I can see your channel removed uh, something outdated seven hours ago, two weeks ago, six months. Because even I'm still in the original one. Do you mind sharing your screen? Or a link to what you're seeing. Could you yeah. send a link? Yes. I think a screen. Um. Okay, then you can share a screen. Okay. I, I'm seeing the same thing. I think it's the same page. I okay. I see fork 12. And yeah. that's the same. Into Your so, I think more people are creating forks. Maybe people will make trainees on this training. Maybe that's why. So, ideally, if you've created the fork, which I see you have, because this is in your GitHub account, it's a new repo in your GitHub account. Mm. When you create a fork, when you're in your version of that fork, it shouldn't show that 12 people have made forks of your fork. That would be weird. So you should only see your copy. And then when you go to the original repo, that's when you can see multiple forks of the repo. Hmm. So how, where do I go to do this branch one you talked about? Because well, then I wanted to do the branch. I saw that there's already one branch and I hadn't created any branch. So... So automatically, when you create a fork, you have one branch, which is called the main branch. Then you can create additional branches where you do other things. So I'm going okay. to walk you through how you can create a branch right here with this same link you shared. Okay. So if you can see my screen, this is your mm -hmm. copy. I'm okay. sharing 
yes, this is your copy. So this is your account. And it says OLS9, you added extra spice to the name of the repo, which is okay. So this says main, mm -hmm. but if you type in here, new branch, newbie, new branch, whatever you choose to call your new branch, you should have, that might be a bit challenging. So instead, if you click on main, if you click on main, it would work for you. If you click on main, you see an option. All right, let me do this in my branch instead. Let's see. So I'm just quickly going back to friendly collab party in my repo to show you how to create a branch. So main, you can find or create a branch. So yeah, I can I see that. Mm -hmm. A new branch. And so I put branch name? Branch. So you click on this that says create new branch from main. New branch. I'm struggling to okay. Let's see how I can move this. This is one way to create a new branch. So if this isn't working for you, I can show you an alternative way to create. A brand, but once you type out the name of the branch, it should give you an option to create new branch. Okay. And so once you click on it, the new branch is created. How are the others faring? Okay. If you successfully created the new branch on your fork, Green marks, please. Okay. One, two, three. Okay. So if you haven't created it yet, please say in the chat what you've tried, what you can see on the screen, and we'll try to help you while we're still on the call. Jane, how are we doing? All good, all good. I, I had given you thumbs up since yeah, oh. that I was done, yes. Nice. Okay. Right. So new branch created. On the new branch, I'm going to create a new branch here for myself. So on the new branch, I want you to try and edit the README adding any line you want to the bottom of the readme. That's file where we describe what our project is about in details. So edits the readme, try and add a line to it. How are we getting along with that? Good. Are we able to edit the readme? Okay. So the next big step now would be to create the infamous pull request. Anyone remember what a pull request is? Feel free to type it in the chat. What is a pull request and what would be the likely response of the person you're sending a pull request to? I'm sorry to drag you back. So after creating the, or rather editing the readme, do I say commit changes? Is that what I Right. Yes. So you put a description. Okay. And you commit the changes exactly. I'm going to do this on my end as well, so it's easy for everyone. Everyone. 
I have right access to this particular repo. So I'm doing what I said to not do. I'm creating a branch directly only because I have right access to OLS repos. And I'm going to edit the readme just so you can see me do it. And apologies for my internet. So at the bottom, I'm just going to say for, for requests demo. And I'll put a descriptive message rather than saying update read me. I'm going to say added, added new line for teaching purposes and hope that they forgive me. So commit directly to new branch. Once you make that commit to the new branch, you're going to see a message on top that says new branch or whatever the name of your branch is, XYZ had recent pushes. And it tells you immediately to compare and pull requests. So you can click on this directly to create a pull request. Quick check, have we all made it to this point? Yeah, I see nods. If you haven't made it to this point, that's okay. Just let us know where you're stuck and we'll help you. So we're going to tell the owner of this repo what exactly we did, what changes you made. Typically, I like to start my pull request by saying this is PR fixes, and then I say what issue it fixes. So I, I type in here a detailed description, X, Y, Z, and hope that they speak random keyboard. And after you've typed in your detailed explanation, you can click on create pull requests. And that pull request comes up. Create pull requests. I'm hoping that I'll start seeing other pull requests being created on this repository. Okay, I'm seeing that Steve already created a pull request. That's really good to see. Um, Ijoma has a hand up. Cool. Okay. okay. I've created, I've updated the readme file, but I don't see where to um oh pull request. Okay, new pull request. Okay. I didn't know I needed to click on pull request before I could make a new pull request, but I didn't see the 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 what what you have shown us on your screen where you where you show this new branch this branch has yes. changes. So is that only on the main on the main project that you're able to see that? Because I didn't see that message in mine. No. So once you make a new change in any branch, and you just go backwards basically you navigate back to your fork it shows at the top of the fork that xyz branch made some changes a few seconds ago a few minutes ago but once you navigate backwards you you see it and that's not exclusive to only the main project yes okay so when i did my pull request it says this branch has no conflict with the base branch is that okay? Yes, we don't want conflicts, not on GitHub or in life. Conflicts are bad. <laughs> so okay. it only means that what you've done doesn't in any way affect what has what already exists in the main branch. 
that's an oversimplification, but you don't want conflicts. It just means that you're good to go. I'm going to refresh and see if anyone else has successfully created a pull request. I like pull. Yay. So we have- I Jay. tried to make a pull request, but then it tells me there are no changes so that there are no changes to make. And I don't know why. Um, click on new, no. click on new instead of that um, create. There are two um, commands. So there is new, I think, I think. I clicked on new pull request. Yeah, that should work. And it tells me there isn't anything to compare when I obviously made changes. So I've put my screenshots on the chat. Okay, Jane, I see your pull request already. Okay, Joma. Let's see. There isn't anything to... Could you send me a link to your copy of this repo? Okay. Thank you. So what I, what I can see is... It's this is the OLS repo yep. instead of yeah, it seems like account. you're comparing your main branch to the main branch of the OLS nine repo. Meanwhile, in reality, your changes happened on the new branch that you created. So where it says compare, you should click on that drop down and change the branch to the branch where you made the actual changes. That's a lot of changes. Does that make sense? I didn't even see compare. So let me let me actually share my link. I'll not share the screenshots, but let me share the link to the branch in the chat. Yes, so you made your changes on new branch. Mm -hmm. but from the screenshot I can see, on the left it says base repository open life science four slash OLS nine. That makes sense. That's the original repo. Mm -hmm. And it's comparing the main branch of OLS nine, but it's comparing it now with your main branch and not with the branch that you created the changes in. So to the right, where it says head repository, your name four slash OLS nine, compare mm -hmm. main. I'm saying that main, you should click on it and change the branch there to new branch where you made the commit. Yes, I, I am on the new branch. And? New pull request. There isn't anything to compare. Same thing. Could you... I'm going to stop sharing my screen real quick and see if you can share your screen. Let's... Okay. Um, I'm not able to. I need permission to share. A moment. I okay. Will... All right. Thank you. Uh, please try now. Yeah. Um, let me know if you can see now. Yes, okay, you are yes, yes, we can see you. Yes. So this is the new branch of my copy, right? This is the main one and this is the new branch. So what am I not doing right? Would you head over to main? Just change that over to main and see. So when you were in your new branch, mm -hmm. check out new branch, you see that it says you have two commits, meaning you made two changes that you saved. Could you click on your two commits? Two commits ahead. 
And so it says you've made some changes. And if you scroll back up to the right, you see create pull requests. Okay. Okay, so is this where I'm supposed to create the pull request from? Yes, instead so of you, a new pull request. Yeah, so you create pull requests from here. Okay. And then I can like add the description. Add the description, yes. And scroll to the bottom and say create pull request. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yes, um, Alfredo has a hand up. Yes. Uh, mm, okay, I will lower my hand. So my question is, uh, in the example <laughs> we were seeing in the screen of Ajoma, uh, she she uh, in her branch she was like two commits ahead and one commit behind the the forked repo was am, am i okay so what what happens when you when you start working on some kind of modifications on a repo that that has been updated after you started working so you're behind the commits in that forked repo am i more or less clear with my my question yes it, 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 it seems like you get in you you are not synchronized with the work on the original repo and then you work and then you don't know how to, how things will be merged or combined or or compatibilized that's my my let's say philosophical crisis with this because it, it has happened i'm not a, a github expert but it has happened several times uh, when I try to work with colleagues that I, I get behind their, their commits and I am ahead on, on other branches and, and everything messes up. Thank you for, for the answer. Yeah, that's, that's a really, really good question. And it's one of the biggest fears of people who use Git and GitHub. That's why I mentioned earlier that nobody wants conflicts. Conflicts are really bad. So if you're, this is one of the reasons we say we keep the main branch as clean as possible. We don't make any changes on the main branch. We do every work independently on each of the separate branches, and then we can merge that. So for instance, you've created a branch called typo fix. To fix that typo we talked about earlier, but someone else, maybe two weeks ago, or a week ago, had created a branch to change the color of a button from green to red and created a pull request, which was merged. So you've already created your own fork and your branch, which will be behind this new button that has changed from green to blue. So that's why we have two terms in GitHub. We have push and pull. So you pull the current changes from the main branch, including things like changing the color of buttons from green to blue, or if someone had done any other thing that was merged into the main repo, you always have the option to pull the main branch. It's actually very recommended to um, regularly pull the main branch to update your branch so that you don't get issues when you're finally ready to create your lovely pull request. You, you want to create your pull request after working so hard on it, only to finally pull and realize that you've been behind so many things and maybe someone even fixed the thing that you spent six years working on. So you always pull to know where the project is at a particular point in time, right? So two things, we keep the main branch clean so that we're not just having so many changes all the time in the main branch, except the things that people have pushed from their own branch and merged into the main branch, which you can occasionally or regularly pull, right? I know there was a lot of terms with pull oh. and push. I hope no one got confused. Sorry, a, a follow-up to that. So how do I pull? Because obviously I was one commit behind like I was, I was behind the branch because he had made a change. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. so please, can you show us how to pull from the main branch? Thank you. That would require, hmm, I'm trying to create a hypothetical situation where someone has 
made some updates. Hmm, let me see. Okay. No, but so I, I, I have shared my the link to my my repository on, on the chats. Maybe you could use that to demonstrate since you already made the change in the main branch. I remember rule number one of GitHub. You don't do things on other people's copies of the repo. So I couldn't possibly make that example with your own copy of the project because it's yours. It's not mine. Oh, I hope okay. that makes sense. So I'm going to show you on my end. I will create. Um, I'm going to make a change on the main branch, which we said we're not supposed to do. But hypothetically speaking, we're going to make a change on the main branch and see how that influences. The internet has been so favorable since the start of the call. Things are looking like. So I'm going to make a change on the main branch of the repo. Change on main branch of repo for example. Purposes. And I will add, typically, I would add a descriptive commit. Please don't write descriptive commits. Put an actual descriptive commit. So I'm going to commit this directly to the main branch just to show you what happens. I'll go back to friendly for that party. Uh, Deb, your screen is not shared. I can't see it. No. Oh no. And I've I've been doing so many things with that. Yeah, sharing. I have you have to do it again. Sorry. So I while I thought I was sharing my screen, this is what I did. I came to the main branch. I added this line in the repo. That line. I'm just going to do it all over. Do over because I forgot to share screen. So sad. So descriptive commits. Remember the purpose of this is just to update the main branch, which we are not, we're not supposed to do is not good practice but I'm updating the main branch. So you see how it affects this branch called new branch. So it says two commits behind, right? So now I'm behind on this branch, but on GitHub, if I come here, if I had, um, if I had made a change on this branch, it would say one commit. Okay, let's just make a change. So it's not too hypothetical. Um, add a line. So new branch had some changes. If I wanted to create a pull request, I could. But I want to look at new branch. New branch is a mess currently. It says one commit ahead because of what I just did now on new branch and two commits behind. So if I wanted to contribute, there's an option usually that would say to dis disregard the commit that I have made on new branch. For some reason it's not here. To disregard the commit and just take what I have on the main branch. So it's like saying, forget about all the changes I made. I just want to pull from the main branch into new branch. Hmm. 
it's weird. I'm not quite sure why I don't see the option to dis discard my commit. It's usually right here, except the one day that I want it to be there. But that is how you would actually update your commit. It gives you the option to pull. Am I still on call? Hopefully. So it gives you the option to either discard or just pull directly from the main branch into the branch you're working on. GitHub has its limitations, which is why personally it's recommended that you use the command line. Command line is way outside the scope of this, but it lets you use specific statements in your shell to say, I want to pull the latest changes on the main branch. And then if there are conflicts, you can resolve it right there. Hopefully that makes sense. I see that we've shot through the time by one minute. That's So at this point, I'm just going to say if anyone has additional questions, please put them in Slack because we respect your time and we don't want to go beyond when we said we would end the call. Hopefully, you've been able to get a few things out of today's call. Um. So one last thing, I know it's um on time. So if if this answer, uh, by that is um, kind of it's understandable in terms of the push and pull request, or if we need to do some kind of follow up. Probably we can have Debs record a short video demonstrating that I share with you all for the difference between the push and pull request. Uh, that's one. Secondly, so I'm sharing a link to previous GitHub sessions that we have. They are on the website, uh, the OLS website. That can also be additional resources that you can go through. And as Debs mentioned, Please, if you have any question, uh, we do have uh, the help um, channel on Slack. We also have a GitHub um, channel on Slack. Those are um, options where you could ask uh, follow-up questions. I will hand over to Debs for final words before we end the session. Thank you all for joining. Yeah, I'm just going to quickly say thank you. Thank you for following along. I know for some of you who are more familiar with Git, it might have felt slow. And for those of you who are not so familiar, thank you for following along and asking questions where you didn't feel very clear. I do appreciate the participation and all the nice emojis I've been seeing. So thank you so very much. And I'm Debs on Slack, so any questions you have, DMs or tag me and I'll respond. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. I will stop the recording.